the, there'll probably be a few more come in, but the, the main purpose of this um, really is not just teaching, though I'm going to teach some. I know most of you have been here before, but um, it's really to get into the presence of the Lord and pray. The purpose of teaching in it is really just to help us to grasp uh, a number of things, including and foremost, our great invitation to come into the presence of the Lord on a regular basis. And But I think <clears throat> on top of that, the, the practicals of how to do that, how to develop a daily life before the Lord is helpful. And that's the intention really is then for us to get into the presence of the Lord on a daily basis and experience the Lord in a beautiful way that he wants us to experience him. And, um, and so that's really the focus of this time. I, I find, honestly, in my journey with the Lord, uh, we, I, there never was a class that, to help me in this. And so what, much of what you're going to hear simply is my own journey. And I have studied others since that time who it seemed like to me had similar journeys, to probably similar to your journey, in just how to get into the presence of the Lord, how to... Uh, how to build a solid, constant, uh, continuous altar uh, in which you can get in, you know, come before the Lord and not um, find uh, the, uh, let's say it this way, the pressures of time and uh, things that we have to do uh, destroy that and take the place of that. So that, as you know, is always going to be a battle involved in this. And uh, really... Um, <clears throat> this proof of the great need of it is in the fact of the battle surrounding it. The more you see the enemy resisting something, the more you want to press in to that reality with the Lord. And this is true with uh, our lives before the Lord. You know, we talk quite a bit here about war and warring, as it should be, but the key to the warrior is intimacy. Amen. So communion prayer, being before the Lord where it's just... I love you, you love me, communion. And however the Lord wants to take that is the key to every warrior. And if any warrior loses that place and just finds himself constantly in a place of war without communion, uh, it'll come to an abrupt halt sooner or later. You'll get whipped in a battle <laughs> because the anchor for our soul is communion and that place of love before the Lord. So we're going to start tonight, <clears throat> and I'm going to just share a few things uh, with us concerning what we're going to be doing as we move forward, if that's okay. Uh, we won't be together next Wednesday night, but we will be, we'll do every other Wednesday night, unless I get clearer in September and October, and then we may move to an every week scenario, at least for a while. If that works with you guys, I had, I had planned schedule-wise because of my concern for what's coming here at the end of the year. I had planned to be home more, so we'll see how all that works. But uh, that's my desire in it. And if we're able, if I'm able to do that, then we could do every Wednesday night if that works for you guys. Yeah. So we'll just see how that goes. Uh, so here's kind of the plan as far as teaching-wise. As we move forward, tonight we're going to talk about the love of God, <clears throat> which is key to opening our hearts and realizing the greatness of God's invitation. Overall, I'm going to entitle the first section as we move through it, The Great Invitation. So the next time we come together, we'll, we'll talk about the four uh, comes that are in the Scripture specifically, such as uh, Come Unto Me, Matthew 11. And then if you want to look ahead... Come boldly, Hebrews 4. Uh, let the little children come. And then finally, the Spirit and the Bride say come there in Revelation 22. So we'll talk about the four comes, the invitation of God to us to come to him. And by the way, the let the little children come is not just talking about physically little children. We can all classify ourselves in that category, I do, because of such is the kingdom of heaven. So I want to be not childish, but childlike in my approaching the Lord. 
with that type of simplicity. So we'll move um, next into the, the uh, beyond the great invitation, we'll move into the secret place being the secret. And then we'll move forward into the, the actual realm of intimacy in communion, praying, and uh, the God alone focus that that demands first and foremost. I'm just giving you a brief outline. Then we'll move into uh, time uh, being of the essence in our being before the Lord. You know, say what we want to say about time. Uh, prayer is not run by the clock, but time is of, of the essence if we're going to spend time in the presence of the Lord. And for those who were here before, you understand the amount of breakthrough that is achieved the longer that we stay in the presence of the Lord, the longer we stay before Him. So those are just a few things that we'll look at. Um, <clears throat> then we, the practical side of that will be we'll move into the building of a prayer life or a prayer altar, uh, and that being within. You can transfer this to the body, or you can transfer this to the home as far as that goes. But I know this, as you know, the key to uh, uh, any corporate body is going to be centered around each member being in the presence of the Lord on their own. Because we know this, it's not what we are before men. It's what we are alone before God that matters. And so when we, we realize that um, God's invitation demands something of us, God's love demands, or better word, maybe it requires something, and what that requirement is, is time for us. Practically speaking, it'll get down to time. So let's look at uh, the, the beginning, which is by no means... Uh, Let's say it this way, all that needs to be said about this, but I believe it's of first importance is the issue of God's love for us in the invitation of God to us. So I want to look at Ephesians chapter 2 briefly. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. Good to see everybody. I know people are still coming in. Verse number 4 of Ephesians chapter 2. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. I just want to focus in upon that. His great love with which he loved us. It is incredibly important that the love of God become very personal to us. It's not enough to know it ethereal. It's not enough to know it doctrinally. It's not enough to know, you know, to know it by certain scriptures. God has to be experienced, and He wants to be experienced. That's the beauty of His great invitation to us. God wants us to experience Him, to know Him, and to know the power of His love. And His love has great power. The anchor for us really is going to center around the issue of love, first and foremost, that God not only loves me, God is in love with me, which takes it to a different level, doesn't it? Yeah. Not just, yes, he loves me, and I could quote that, I could say that, but he is in love with me. It makes it very personal. And we have to move it off the ground of the impersonal onto the ground of the personal. He loves us. That's said to the church here, but it comes down to every individual. God loves us. God loves you. God loves me. God loves people. And so uh, that has to really hit our hearts in such a way, and here's the purpose of God in it, when we encounter him in the power of his love, that love begins to free us, particularly in our battles. We talked about this before. But in our battles with not measuring up, the condemnation that comes with that, failure, the condemnation that comes with that, we're all in favor of conviction that leads us to repentance, but not condemnation that just makes us to feel like we're hopeless. And we just have to understand the difference. Condemnation is, the, is meant by the enemy to give you no out but uh, 
get away or suicide. It makes it a hopeless situation. You're never going to be whatever. That is never God, ever. God does not move, never has, never will in condemnation in that kind of way. God's condemnation is very clear in the scripture. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. That's pretty much the extent of condemnation toward us, that this is our condition. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, and we need his life. But the enemy's condemnation is a regular attack against us, and to really defeat it is not to just identify the condemnation. That's important. But to know the love of God. God wants us to know the power of his love, the depth of his love, the height of his love, the breadth of his love, and the width of his love. I've identified three types of love in the scripture. Uh, there, there can be more, but I've identified these three. They're prevalent. There is the love of God as creator loves creation. We are all created by a creator who loves his creation. But that's not the deepest form of love. It's a creator. create That offers us a creator-created relationship, which is not why we were created. We were created for more than just knowing God. Yes, he's my creator. We know this. It's simple, but this is being recorded and, and because people have asked for help in this arena out and about as well as local, I thought we would record these things and make it available to people, eventually into some little booklet to help them any way we can. Make it as inexpensive and do what we did with the other book, making it, making it free or on an offering basis to them. Anything that we can do to help people, particularly in this most important area of how to connect with God and how to fight through all the condemnation and how to fight through all that perhaps Depending on our parents, maybe our parents put a unrealistic measure of expectation upon us. That means this, that they required of us things, and failure in that requirement brought great condemnation with it or accusation with it. They may, or may, may not be you, but if it is you, know that your Heavenly Father is not that way. So um, his requirement of us only deals within the realm of what is possible. And first and foremost, we cannot be uh, godly without God's Son living in us. It's an impossibility. We cannot measure up without Christ being in us. He will become the measurement. So I'm just being simple, but let's get back to this issue of the three types of love. We're more, we're more than just a creation to God. We are that, but we're purposed and destined for more than that. We're more than just people who are born again, true meaning of being saved, be the born again people. That, me that measure of love is a need-based love that says, look, we had a great need as a creation, humanity did. God met that need. Now, through that, there's aspects of God that was made known to the rest of the creation, at least in part, that they had not seen, such as mercy, grace, forgiveness. That was not made known to the angels who fell. It was made known, though, to us by the Son of God. So that was a revelation, or revelations, that came through even our failure. God is revealed then as being a merciful, gracious God who forgives. And the way he does that, the behind that is by taking the blow due to us. Isn't that right? Isaiah 53 speaks that very directly. The blow that was due to us came upon him. So uh, what we realize then that God is not only uh, loving in word but loving in deed he acts according to love, and he literally takes the blow. He takes our place in punishment for that fall, for the sin of man. We have a place to come. We have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. So we see 
a need-based love being exhibited. We have a need. God meets that need out of his own love. But having said that, and not by any means feeling like, well, we've really explored that depth and we know all there is to know. That's not true. But I'm saying this to us. Yet we were called to a much deeper love than that. Had man not fallen, he would have come into the deepest realm of the love of God that has yet to be revealed. So man did not have to fall to come into that deep realm. It was his eternal purpose, God's eternal purpose through humanity to reveal that realm and to invite us into that realm and then through us unveil that realm to the rest of the creation. So the final, what I've termed, uh, what would be the great height, depth, breadth, and width of the love of God is seen in a creation called humanity and God's invitation to it to be a bride. The whole creation of humanity was created to be a bride to the Son of Man who is the eternal Son of God, who is the Word, who is the Lamb. We were invited into a relationship thus of all that marriage eternally shows. We were invited into a relationship of companionship with the Lamb. Because we have, you know, the bride is the wife of the Lamb. So we were invited into that relationship specifically and we still are and so the love of God though in that it has a height has a depth has a width has a breadth and we could and will not tonight but we'll go through what does it mean depth of love height of love some of that's real simple it's a height that reaches all the way to God himself the highest of heights it's a depth that reaches to the very depths of God's, let's use this human word, heart. What is its width? What is its breadth? Well, it's yet to be fully explored. You enter into this relationship of love, where's it going? We talk about that some here in this body, uh, and when we talk about eternal purpose. And God's desire to bring us, here's a part of its width and breadth, bring a creation to the throne. I don't know if you can go any further than that. You can in, in talking through certain areas, but that really hits what is the height, depth, breadth, and width of the love of God. He would bring us, we were made for this purpose, as a bride as what we could call a queen to the king, a bride, an, an Esther to the king. Or, uh, you know, if we're dealing with uh, Jacob, <clears throat> we're dealing with Rachel, or if we're dealing with Isaac, we're dealing with Rebecca. All these, not only the man, but the woman, and God was very clear, as you guys know, about the choosing of the wife of Isaac, particularly, of what she could be and what she couldn't be. So God was showing us something there of his own heart. Marriage itself is the great revealing of what we would call the heart of God. And believe me, behind the purpose is heart, and more heart and love than anything else. God's not purpose-driven is completely motivated by love. So his purpose comes out of love. And it deals, as we're talking here, it deals with a sharing of himself, a giving of himself, an offering of himself. So that's the greatest thing I believe that could be offered is God offering us himself. And in saying yes to intimacy, what we're saying yes to is not a way of praying. What we're saying yes to is connecting with God in his heart. Beyond all forms and formulas, formulas can't touch that. They won't bring in the love of God. That's the failure of formulas of prayer. And we can talk about, and we'll talk about practicals in our time, but practicals have to be centered rightly, foundationally, in the love of God. We're wanting to connect with him. 
We're wanting to know him, aren't we? That's why I believe y'all are here. And, and I believe this gathering shows what I've believed all along. Uh, and this is just true of why we were created. We were created for him. And it shows our desire as a people for the Lord. And um, that's a good sign for us as a people. You know, we're, we're confessing to the Lord. We want to know you, and we want to know you at a depth that we were meant to know you. And I don't know what that means, but God does. And therein I trust him. One thing about it, Rod, he's going to bring us out of my little comprehension, isn't he, or our comprehension, because I don't know what he knows. I don't see what he sees. I don't even see the full completion of all this but i know this that it is being driven by the love of god and i'm in with with him in fact think this through everything that's going on and we're doing is undergirded by the love of god i know in my life in the going and all of that why do i do that why do i want to do that because of the love of god why a confrontational mode with the church because of the love of god why an in your face time of the jealousy of god with his people because of the love of God. Seriously. Because we've left somebody, God, behind, and the church has progressed, but not on spiritual ground. And it's not progressed into the eternals. It's not progressed into the heavenlies. It's progressed into self. It's the love of God that is driving all true ministry. Don't you think? driving our hearts isn't it love when a parent disciplines their child because that child's in a place of behavior that's going to cause them to bring harm to themselves or others where is the love of God in it in us if he's not here's what it says all of his sons are disciplined and scourged and friends where, by the way, I'm just this is a side note, but we're in a time where the scourging and discipline of God is really needed in the church. Think it through. We've, we've had a generation come up that knows nothing about discipline. In fact, psychology has ruled out discipline. And the church is a chameleon of that fact. Even I'm talking about this kind of discipline. Discipline to set aside a place and a time for God and stick to it. And we find in the church of America that I said this, you know, uh, last time, but the average prayer life, this was several years ago, this was brought out of pastors, is three to five minutes a day. I think that's overstating it. I do. Most pastors that I know, they don't pray. I've had, I've had major prophetic leaders who are friends of mine, tell me, I, I, I don't know how to get alone and pray. I'm not naming names because you'd know them. How many can say with me, Houston, we got a problem? Yeah. Then what are you doing? I'll tell you what they're doing. Offering, operating off a of gifting. Yeah. And haven't we learned our lesson? I don't think we have. Have we, Chris? <laughs> and it's, it's a telltale sign when you have that going on to where you can't lead people beyond where you've been. And if our leaders are not there before the Lord, the best thing we're going to get out of them is an echo of other people who they're reading and studying. And uh, one thing we must never become here, this is part of my comments last time I spoke, is an echo of other men and women of God. I refuse to let that happen. That's the way denominations are made. I know friends of mine, just, just going to be on the recording, but... They have, uh, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, they have an over-fondness of William Branham. And we have a whole movement that believes that the voice of God died with William Branham. He was the last prophet in the earth. The Branhamites are their names. I've encountered them. You know what they do on church Sundays? They listen to old recordings of William Branham. That's what they do. That's what they play. I'm using an extreme here. That's why I said what I did about T. Austin Sparks. I honor T. Austin Sparks, but T. Austin Sparks appeared to me, just going to tell you this, appeared to me, warned me about this body, that we must not become a follower of him. So, Jack? The vineyard murder kind of hit the wall. Remember, passed away. It did. I mean, they just came up against the wall and they couldn't progress any 
Yes. If I fall, does this body go on? Yes. It has to, or else everything will be a failure. It cannot be built around me. It cannot be re- built around anyone but the Lord. Listen, I honor T. Austin Sparks. I honor William Branham. I've met William Branham several times in heaven, and he is in heaven. But, but friends, what we must not do is assume that just because we're feeding off of a person, that that's what God wants us to do and share publicly. Mm-hmm. What God wants us to share publicly is what is fresh from him. Yeah. Yeah. It comes from feeding off of him <coughs> and being with him, not books, him. Can you hear what I'm trying to say? Eat of him. Drink of him. And then you'll share him. And it won't be another man's revelation. Because you can't stand for another man's revelation. It was his revelation. Not yours. So you, somewhere down the line here, we, we get back to this point. Feeding. Eating of him. Intimacy with God. The fountain of God's life comes from that. You drink. You eat, you partake of him. And out of the abundance of that partaking and of that eating, it flows. It's not worked up. It's not an echo. It's not a teaching that another man or woman had. It's coming from a relationship with the Lord. And most of the time what he does, he'll take the scriptures in that relationship and he'll, he'll speak it to your inward man, this passage, and then he'll explain himself. And I love that dynamic. I love when God takes the scriptures and unveils things that, you you know what, friends? Surely others have had God do the same thing to them, but when you don't know about that and you've never heard about that, don't you get excited? Yeah. God wants that with us constantly. We're meant to do that. We're meant to feed off him. So intimacy is this beautiful dynamic. It's a relationship where God, this, this is what it is, uh, we're living not off of bread alone. We're living by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Yeah. Every word. God's voice to us is that precious. However it comes. Whether inward or it's audible or it's visionary or it's dream state or what, whatever way the voice of God is going to come. I'm just, I'm just yes and amen. Whatever way it's going to come. But what I want to make us hungry for, which I believe we are, what I want to make us hungry for is that place before the Lord and that place before the Lord being based around his love, that he draws us there and he teaches us in that place how to fight. And the first fight you'll find is how to maintain that place. That'll be the first fight, how to maintain that place. Don't let things crowd it out. And if a day happens to where that thing is a necessity and you have no other choice, you move at that time in that day to another location even if it means losing sleep. Now, that may sound rigid. I'm not trying to be rigid. I'm fighting for what I know is that, let's say it this way, is the life breath of the believer. This is more than just food, honestly, and drink. It's breath. It is first breath God breathes into us. That's creation. But there's another breath. And God living in us because of the Spirit's entrance. The Spirit of God coming into us. And what the Spirit of God would do in us is teach us how to really commune. Isn't that a beautiful word? Beyond prayer, communion. How to commune with Him. How to still quiet ourselves in the presence of the Lord. And let the Lord just engage us. I believe that also, just as a side note, we'll cover this more in depth later, but I believe that's one of the best places to have your senses trained is in that presence of the Lord. And uh, where silence is on us. And during the silence, we're trying to hear. And we're trying to see. Not with these eyes. These eyes. Not with these ears. Supernatural ears of our spirit. So back to love. Great love is what it's called here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 4. Great love. So we have the adjective in front of this. Paul's explaining that it's not just the love of man or love like any other being. This is God's great love that we're dealing with. 
And it's being expressed towards humanity here in this passage. And specifically towards a portion of God's people. But it's for all of God's people. You know what is the truth, friends? Before it's all over, and it goes unto the goal, it's through humanity that the great love of God is going to be seen by the rest of the creation. We're going to be the examples. We're, we're going to be a representation of the love of God to the rest of the creation. The love of God encountered experientially frees us from fear. We know that from the scriptures. Perfect love cast out all fear. So if you're dealing with fear, the best way to combat a spirit of fear, because that's what you're dealing with, always put your finger on things. People say, well, man, not everything's a demon. Who told you that lie? And I know that sounds weird, but let me say why I'm saying that. People for too long have given over to the natural mind. And we now have a natural-minded situation in the church. It's Greek. It can be very stoic. But the denial of the demonic doesn't help us. It hurts us greatly. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood alone. But against, this is Ephesians 6, we're wrestling against demonic forces, spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. We're wrestling against principalities. That's what Paul says. So notice the wording. We're wrestling against them. That means we're in hand-to-hand -hand combat with them. That's what wrestling is. It's not a long-range gun shooting at them. We're in a very close personal struggle with them. This flies in the face of a lot of teaching, doesn't it? I know it does. And I catch a lot of flack because of it. But friends, just because things are written and says don't do something, when the Bible's saying this is the truth, I'm going to, I'm going to choose to believe the Bible. Not only that, I'm going to choose personal experience <clears throat> where I am in direct battle with demonic powers on a regular occasion. Not that I go looking for them. Not that I like it. <laughs> None of that's true. <laughs> but it is what it is. So I'm saying all this to say to us, to say to all of us, listen, the enemy is real, and the enemy is involved around our lives to hinder us, to restrict us, to push us into greater and greater unbelief, greater and greater distance, he would destroy us except for the protection of God. And much of that protection centers around angelic assignment to us. So believe you me, uh, Jesus knew what battle was, and he could identify Satan even if he was speaking through Peter. Now, when's the last time you saw in a church gathering someone stand up and address somebody and say, get behind me, Satan? <laughs> and what Peter must be talking about, what, what must Peter have felt about? How demeaning would that be? But the Son of God didn't pull no punches, went right at the thing. He knew the voice of Satan, and even, even though he was speaking through his friend Peter. And I know that's true, because I've been that voice. I've had the enemy use me just like I've had the Lord use me. Makes me sad to say that, but it's true. And can be true again. So we're all aware of that, aren't we? Satan uses vessels just like the Lord does. Well, anyway, I deviate from my purpose in this. Here's my purpose. is to drive home this issue. The love of God in this will keep our soul anchored. In the most difficult of circumstances. When you're, let's, let's just put it in a few scenarios. When you're about to be martyred for your faith, it is the love of God that controls you. When you're under any heavy temptation, let the love of God invade you and control you. You know what I'm saying? If it doesn't seem real, I mean invade in this. He's in you, but let him fill your natural senses. 
and let him fill you with spiritual reality of a keeping love. I'm not in this for myself alone. I am compelled by the love of God. That should be true of every one of us, don't you think? There's a compelling power to the love of God. He loves me, and here's the commitment. Because of his great love, I have surrendered myself completely to him. I have given myself away to him. Because of his great love, I am no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I'm going to glorify God in my body. What is the compelling factor in that? The love of God. Not a doctrine. Not a theology. Not, well, I'm a warrior and I'm going to fight it out. No, the love of God. The love of God is the key element to the warrior. But what are we fighting for? God who loves. God who loves humanity and does not want humanity to go down this path to its destruction. And so to get involved in that fight for humanity, to get involved in the fight for the church to be what it's meant to be, for the individual believer to know the love of God, to have eyes that can see the Lord, hear the Lord, their senses trained, those are areas of contending that's going on. Someone's got to contend. But believe you me, it's driven by the love of God. Because the war that that brings on to you, you would be foolish to go into it for any other means than the love of God compels me. So, uh, willingness to die is coming from a compelling love. For me, for you, what does death mean? It's an exodus out of, an, out of this natural body and into an eternal body in relationship with the Lord. And give me that opportunity and I'm ready. If it's my time, thank God. <laughs> you know, I'm ready. So love, I'm, I'm just touching on this a little bit. Maybe I'm going too long on it, but I don't think I can say too much about this issue. The missing element of love in our relationship with God will lead us to the brink of disaster. It is key that we know the love of God that surpasses, think about it, understanding human-wise. Therefore, it has to be experienced. We have to know him. We have to experience him in his love. It's one thing to hear it read from the Bible. It's another thing for God himself to say it directly to you. I love you. It's like reading a letter from your sweetheart versus your sweetheart standing in front of you with a kiss. I love you. Which is better? <laughs> By far, standing in front of you, holding you. So God wants us to know that, and we need to know that every day. That's why the importance of positioning ourselves in the presence of the Lord without agenda. I'm here for one reason, the Lord. I'm not here to war. I'm here for him. I'm not here to battle for anybody or anything. I'm here to receive him and to know him and experience him. And all the transformation that comes with that, by the way. You know what I'm saying? There'll be time for war, but there needs to be time first for communion. And then we'll have the strength of God to fight. Because without that communion, we're just going to get it handed to us out here sooner or later. Fighting is going to wear us down without the continual strength that comes from feeding, eating, and breathing the Lord. So how do you make a church full of warriors? Have a church full of people who are in a place of communion with God. The purpose of this meeting. That's the real behind this. Is And, and let's get back to a point here. I want to get to a deliverance point. The power of deliverance that is in the love of God. You know, for too long we see ourselves and know ourselves, and it's true and it's real. We know our we know our failures, and they're legitimate failures. We know our faults, they're legitimate faults. And we can live around those things constantly plaguing us, hindering us, preventing us from approaching the Lord. Or we can know the love of God that tells us to come in that condition and receive help. 
and we'll make the choice. Either, well, when I get better, I'll approach the Lord, or realize you'll never be better until you approach the Lord, <laughs> which is what the Scripture says. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may find help in your time of need. So we'll talk more about that scripture uh, next time. But <clears throat> my point being this, for too long we've been lied to. We do what Adam and his wife did. We hide from the Lord because of shame. Isn't that what they were doing? Hiding in the garden as if the Lord didn't know where they were. <laughs> so his question to them, where are you, did not mean I can't see you. It meant this, what have you done <laughs> that you're hiding from me? And he knew what they had done, but he wanted them to confess. So notice in that what God doesn't do. He doesn't condemn them. Not a single time. And he's not going to condemn us by coming to him in a state of failure. What we must be aware of, if we don't come to him in that state of failure, then we leave ourselves open to all kinds of things entering in through that door. Because we need the love of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the forgiveness of God to be exercised by Christ unto us. And it frees us. That love sets us free. And that love makes us free. Both are true. It's one thing to just be set out of a cage and say, I'm free. It's another thing that when you're a buzzard, to become an eagle. That's make free. And I want not to be the buzzard feeding on death. I want to be an eagle. How about you? We're meant to be an eagle. So set free is beautiful, but made free is even better. And well, how does that happen? Well, it's by partaking of him, communion with him, knowing that the love of God is drawing us to him, not pushing us away from him. God's not pushing us away, friends. He's drawing us close, summonsing, inviting us. If there's any running away, that's our part. <laughs> so if you want to see the Lord in that most of the time, he's calling after us, stop, come back. <laughs> you know, that's really what's going on, truly. We're doing all the running. You know, if we would learn, if I would learn, if all of us learn this, run to the Lord. Adam and Eve, first step in failure should have been towards the Lord instead of hiding. And that's the key for us. You failed, run to the Lord. You will always find his love, his mercy, his grace there. You'll find it. But that's not the only form of love we want, is it? What about if we don't fail? Well, still, we need the love of God every day. Love of God in, in different depth, in different height. The love of God that says, you're mine, and I'm yours. My banner over you is love. I need to know that from the Lord. And I don't just need to know it scripturally, do I? Back, I do. That'll help me, but not as much as the embrace and the tenderness of the kiss of God to you, to me. When it's very personal. Man, I was in the presence of the Lord. And the love of God was all around me. Had you had that experience? When the love of God's been all around you and you're bathing yourself. You don't want to ever leave it. And time just seems to cease. You're not concerned about the clock anymore. You're not there for the clock. You're there for the Lord. And the love of God's all around you. And the kindness of God. And the sweetness of God in His presence. And you just want to stay there. And you realize, I was made for this. I was made to be with him. He wanted me. Not what I could do for him. Me. Isn't that sweet? Mm -hmm. Remember that. If nobody else wants you, the Lord does. <laughs> Sometime in life, you may come up against that. You feel that way at least. It's not necessarily true, but you're going to feel that way. A few times in life, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but most of us in this room have felt that, experienced that a few times in life. When it seemed like you stood alone, no one else understood, no one else cared. That's not really true, but it feels that way sometimes. But we need this from the Lord. The presence of the Lord, it assures me I'm with you and you're with me. 
My banner over you is love, and it will remain there. I'm saying to you, come. I'm welcoming you to come. I'm inviting you to come. So we have this great invitation according to the love of God. And the love of God's not wishy-washy. It's not willy-nilly. It's not up and down. It's not emotional, though it affects our emotions. <laughs> and it uh, does mine, doesn't it, yours? I cry. Sometimes I laugh. Sometimes there's joy. Sometimes there's weeping. But it's a joyous weeping. God affects us. He's meant to affect us. You know, so we're pushing that with people now by experiencing the love of God. We're pushing them to a place to where they really encounter Him. And when we encounter Him, He does something to us. And transformation's in it. And transfiguration is in it. And I need it. And so do all of us. Wouldn't you agree? So this is our starting place in our series of what we're going to do as far as the teaching of it. But what I want us to do prayer-wise tonight is go after a specific dynamic of what we've been talking about. I want to know the love of God in a deeper way than ever before. We can talk about this, and we have been, with all that's in front of us on a day-to-day basis, what you go through on a day-to-day basis, all the surprises, all the unknowns of that, of life, what keeps us? The love of God. And to experience that love and its power, to have that unleashed in us and through us, that's the way it should be, first in, then through. But forget about the through for a moment, in. We all know this, there's people that uh, need to be loved that don't know how to be loved, and they resist love. And um, without being intentional, if we're filled with the love of God, that love can go right towards them without even being intentional. It has that kind of power. And so uh, any way you look at this, any way you examine it, what the body of Christ is sorely lacking right now is the love of God. Because it's lacking intimacy. The two go hand in hand. If we draw close to him, we're going to encounter the power of his love. If you find yourself presently in a place of great condemnation, I'm looking at it here tonight. You're in a place where you've really been battling condemnation, really been battling fear really been battling along these lines of whether God loves me, God cares for me. What we want tonight, what God wants tonight. It's not just what we want. God wants this way more than we want it. (laughs) He's always wanted this. Is the love of God that truly delivers our hearts. Truly frees us to really know Him. Really experience the power of His love. That God would rend the veils tonight that are keeping us from his love. Just rip them apart. And allow the love of God to flow into our inward man. And fill us to a great fullness and an overflowing fullness. Is that not a good prayer? Let's make that prayer. We'll kick off prayer with that. And I want you guys to feel free to pray. It may be personal. That's great for this this time. This is not Friday nights. For this time, be personal. Cry out to God for your own personal life, for your family. Cry out for the love of God to be revealed and released and manifested. We want that, and we need it, don't we?